Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today, we're tackling episode 47, The Family Business. As a note, I'm really hoping to reach 50,000 subscribers before the birth of my first child at the beginning of May, and we're only about 10,000 subscribers away, and I think we can do it. So make sure to check if you're subscribed, and if you're not, hit the button. I would really appreciate it. As this episode opens, Laura asks if they can still see Gurn, but... Matt says they cannot, and that will be relevant in a bit. Scanlan casts Morning Kanan's magnificent mansion for the first time and conjures a magic door that leads to a pocket plane with a whole ass mansion inside, including 100 ghostly servants. It's one of my favorite spells. Scanlan also agrees to allow the Ashari to enter the mansion so they can sleep inside for the night if they want. Grog sees this as the perfect opportunity to feed Craven Edge, not by murdering the Ashari. Sorry, I should be clearer. He has the spectral servants bring him a cow. But the cow is also spectral, so even though Grog punches it multiple times in the face, it does not bleed. So there's no point in butchering it to feed his magic sword. d and is a weird game. Grog and Vex go to the basement, where there's a training area, but in fact, going to train was just a ruse. Vex just wanted to get into the bag of holding and grab Gurren's broom. But of course, she doesn't know how to make it fly. She just sort of shouts some stuff at it and then dejectedly gives up. Now, I want to pause here and say that rules as written, Vex would just know everything about this broom if she examined it over a short rest. But that's not usually what the party does. It's happened occasionally. It basically happened after the Briarwood arc when they got Craven Edge and some other items. And there's a hilarious example coming in less than a dozen episodes, but most of the time they don't get the little cards from Matt until somebody casts Identify on the item or otherwise tells them what it does. Like when they go shopping at Gilmore's, they get a verbal description of generally what the item does, and then they get a card with all the details. In general, I really prefer this method. It depends a lot on your group and the pace you're trying to keep up and how important you want certain spells to be, but in general, I feel like this approach helps magic items feel a bit more mysterious and allows the discovery of how the item works to be a bit more fun and makes them a bit feel a bit more meaningful. And if someone in the party knows Identify, then it can make that player feel very useful. Of course, nobody in Vox Machina has that spell, so they're at the mercy of whoever has the highest Arcana skill, and that happens to be Scanlan. Vex asks Scanlan for a moment in private, and he comedically misunderstands slash she implies uh, that she's hitting on him. But then she reveals the broom and asks for his help identifying it. He doesn't roll a high enough arcana to know what the trigger word is for the broom, because I don't really think any arcana roll could reveal that. But then Matt does allow a high investigation check to reveal a draconic word subtly etched into the wood that reveals the trigger word. It's the draconic word for candle. <laughs> And sure enough, that word makes the broom fly, which means for the rest of the campaign, anytime she wants to use the broom, she has to pretend to hack and spit. Scanlan chides her for stealing from Gurn, and she says she was going to give him dragon scales, but as we learned earlier, he's gone now and she did not get the chance. So Scanlan says since they cannot help Gurn, he'll pick someone else for her to help at some point in the future, and that will be her penance. Also, it has to be said, Laura is over the moon excited to have flight available again. The party goes to sleep, but during the night, Sir Konos, the leader of the Pyra tribe, comes to Keyleth to voice his concerns. Four years ago, a young woman, maybe 15 years old, came to Pyra looking to make a new life. They took her in and trained her as is their way. Although when Keyleth asks about her age now, Sir Konos says she really didn't seem to age much. Over the last few months, she's grown distant, lingering in the forest for long periods of time. And then, on the day the rift tore open and Thordak emerged... She was the one who did that. She used ancient magic the druids did not teach her, and laughed as she ripped the rift open. Sirkonos also says her name was Raishan. Now, Sirkonos basically delivers this as a parable, to be careful who you trust if they haven't proven themselves. But that's just the in-universe explanation. That's not why this scene is here. No, it's here to establish something very important. Raishan, the green dragon, is the one who freed Thordak and almost obliterated the fire Ashari. She possesses magic strong enough to rip a wound in the world, and she can essentially take any form and hide herself for years, eluding detection from some of the most powerful druids in Exandria. You might recall that I pointed out back in episode 39 that Raishan's was the first dragon name we learned. I think that was very important. Matt knew Raishan and Thordak were responsible for the most devastation to the loved ones of our party members, so theirs are the first and last names we learned. I don't even know if he did it on purpose, but it certainly worked. It made Raishan and Thordak the iconic monsters of the Siege of Amon. And as it turns out, they're both very, very important to this arc as a whole, because they did the most damage to our player characters' souls. Also, now they know Raishan is a girl dragon. They didn't know that before. I mean, technically, that doesn't have to be the case. Raishan the dragon could be a boy who posed as a human girl, but they do correctly guess that she's a girl dragon. But the night is not over. Matt turns to Vax and describes a dream. He's falling into darkness, black feathers around him, but stops at a field of golden threads woven into a web. The Raven Queen appears and calls him her champion, her fate touched. 
On hearing that, Marisha and Talison silently lose their shit, because they've played in Matt's games before, and they know that someone being fate-touched means their actions have a huge impact on the world around them, or events tend to congregate around them, good or bad. Like, hypothetically, having your mother killed by a red dragon, and then years later that same red dragon conquers the continent and topples the government while you're standing 15 feet away from the king. Now, given how Matt structures the Vox Machina campaign, and to a degree, how he structures all of the Critical Role campaigns, you could argue that all of the player characters are a little bit fate-touched. But in this case, Matt deliberately set out to basically make sure Vax is the type of character with a huge impact. But this was not part of his plan from the very beginning. Instead, he added this detail when Liam started going through a really difficult time in his personal life. And then, when Vax made that very tempting offer to the Raven Queen, Matt couldn't pass up the opportunity to induct Vax into service to the Goddess of Death. This is you, my champion. You are fate-touched. The choice is yours. Rebirth or ruin. Maker or martyr. Conqueror. Tyrant. Or... Nothing. And then Matt turns his attention to Grog and describes another dream. Grog is blinded by light, fighting in a gladiatorial arena, and feeling amazing as Craven Edge feeds. But when the light fades and he can finally see, he's surrounded by the corpses of normal people. Farmers. Children. Pike. And then he sees his uncle Kevdak and the rest of the herd, and they bend the knee to Grog. And Kevdak says Grog has made him proud. Let's talk a little bit about the way Matt runs these sorts of dream sequences. We talked a bit about dreams when Matt told his players what was keeping them up at night, right after the Chroma Conclave attack, and we talked about whether it's okay to tell your players how they feel. Here, Matt levels up his dream sequences. He targets only two player characters, Vax and Grog, and focuses on moving their storylines forward. Vax's strange new relationship with the Raven Queen and Grog's dynamic with his vampiric sword are clearly kind of important subplots that have been running underneath the last few episodes. And so Matt basically adds a scene to help provide some context. The Raven Queen scene doesn't give a lot of exposition, but we get the visual of the Golden Web, which we will see again in future associations with the Raven Queen. We get a moment where she basically actually speaks to him, and that's a pretty huge deal. She confirms that he is her champion, and she calls him fate-touched, and says that he has the potential to be anything. And that is really important for a lot of reasons. See, Vax keeps falling in this dream, and falling is like one of the most universal ways to depict someone feeling like they have no control in life. And that's probably a fair way to describe how Vax has felt about the Raven Queen situation so far. And so the message of this dream could be read as Vax feeling like his life is out of his own hands. But the Raven Queen herself says the opposite. She says Vax actually has a ton of control, and when the player character has accidentally joined up with a god of death he knows nothing about, and seems to, at the very least, have a lot of mixed feelings about it, reminding them that they still have agency, despite feeling like things are out of control, well that is a really valuable message to convey to your player. On the other hand, Grog's dream conveys the opposite message, that he actually is trapped. You find yourself walking alone, a long hallway into blinding light. You have to cover your face, it's so bright. But you push forward, because you know there's only one way to go. You sense others around you, closing in suddenly. A voice, ever whispering in your ear, says, release me. Still blinded, eyes closed, on instinct, you pull the cold, dark blade from your back and swing wide, over and over again, feeling the shuddering shock of each impact, your strength matched by the razor-like edge of your weapon cleaving down any who would approach. The high of adrenaline is incredible, and you laugh aloud at the sheer thrill of your own power. <laughs> <laughs> the light subsides and your vision returns. You look to see hundreds of people dead at your feet. Farmers, children. You see Pike, motionless, cast among the carnage. You want to scream, but instead you laugh against your own judgment and intent, like you're locked within yourself and have no control. The dream is a warning that Grog is heading down a path that has only one conclusion, the death of innocence and the death of his friends. And then Matt shows Kevdak, Grog's uncle, finally honoring Grog with respect. He literally says, you have finally made me proud. And this puts a question in front of Grog. Do you want to keep going down this road and become the kind of person who Kevdak would approve of? He has no agency in the dream. But of course, it's just a dream. In reality, Grog has the freedom to choose what to do next, if he can recognize the warning for what it is and change course before it's too late to turn back. And that's a really important beat in the Craven Edge storyline. 
We're going to see a lot of dream sequences across the span of Critical Role, but these dream sequences are exactly the type that I love and that I try to emulate in my own games whenever I need to hit a player with some spooky dreams. The next morning, Vex comes clean to the party, and it's a tricky situation because, like, everyone knows she shouldn't have stolen their friend's flying broom. That's not in dispute. But nobody is in any position to judge. They all knowingly stole Allura's carpet long after the moment it saved their lives. Vax's main argument isn't that he's in a position to judge, simply that it's a bit out of character. I don't think he means that in the meta, your character wouldn't do that way, although maybe he does, I don't know. But I assume he means that in the realistic, real-life way that we say, I'm judging you a little bit for this thing you did and wouldn't normally do. But he obviously can't say he's judging her, since he's done plenty of the same in his own time. Of course, Percy's main point is, how are you going to fire a bow and arrow while riding on a flying broom? So Vex does some target practice, and yeah, this is not going to work full-time. It, it gives her a disadvantage on every attack. So Percy starts working on designing a seat for the broom so she can fly and shoot. Keyleth fills them in on her conversation with Sir Konos, and then they discuss where to go next. Now, they've only got a few leads. Look for Grog's tribe and try to get the Titanstone Knuckles from Kevdak, or go find the other Sphinx and get information about other vestiges. In case you need a refresher on Grog's backstory, because the party asks for a refresher in this episode as well, but Grog grew up as a part of a tribe of wandering murderers, basically. But they encountered a feeble old gnome, and Grog thought he seemed so helpless they should spare him. Kebdak, Grog's uncle and the leader of his tribe, was pissed, so Grog had to fight his own cousin, Kebdak's son. Grog won that fight, but then Kebdak beat him and left him for dead. Of course, the feeble old gnome wound up being Pike's great-great-grandfather, and he and Pike healed Grog and raised him. And so this conversation is fascinating, because Grog is petrified of facing Kebdak, and is doing everything he can to make sure they go do something else. Anything else but his pride also won't allow him to admit fear. Grog had some uh, brass knuckles to get? Was that a thing? Did we get those? Uh, no, we haven't gotten those yet. Okay. But there's a lot of other things to explore. All right. It's time for a family reunion. Grog, are you ready for that? Or do you want to put that off a bit? Oh, no, man. We, I mean, whenever. It's, so you, you want know. to go like now, or do you want to maybe... Swing by so somewhere. that or the library, I imagine. You want to go to the library? No, I was just saying that it's either that or <laughs> so the library. So it's Grog's herd or the Sphinx. Is but look, anywhere? look, I was thinking, look, it might be like a thing when we find them, right? So look, yeah. picture this. Me and then a lot of other me's and they're all really big and angry. So look, like, if we want to do anything else before that happens. I think they'll attack us, but we're with you. You're an ally. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a super cool, awesome, fun guy. But we didn't really leave in, like, the best terms. Can I borrow your hat? Uh, of course you can borrow my hat. I want to borrow your hat. Sure. Hat of disguise? If you don't want to have an immediate confrontation with your family, there's no particular reason why they have to know you're alive yet at all. You could wear this hat. Might not fit on your head. You could maybe put it on one of your knuckles. Not hiding from my herd. Well, I, you were giving off the impression of one who was looking forward to putting something off. I was, was I? You were. You're not anymore. <laughs> As Very if you've big been dead somehow. Very big. If you're too scared to do it, we can go elsewhere. Sorry. I will never say that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm excited to go. I want to go. We should go. Um, all right, all right, fuck. Uh, look, um, if there's a lot of them, and only like a handful of us, it's not usually customary to have two sides go at each other. If we want those knuckles, I'm pretty sure it might have to be one on one. Now, <laughs> I know I can totally take my uncle, <clears throat> but I wouldn't mind if we found like a few extra credit items before we did that, <laughs> just in case, you know, I have like the flu that morning, you know, or it burns when I pee, just something to like take the edge off. So Sphinx first. Sphinx, I think it is. I mean, if that's what you want to do, then yeah. <laughs> Say no more. So this scene actually gives us two great lessons as players. The first is that pride is a terrific character flaw. You see how Grog bristled when it seemed Percy was insinuating that Grog was scared? Grog actually has quite a lot of pride, but it only comes up at certain moments. 
For example, Grog does not like to be perceived as weak or scared. Or stupid, though that form of pride is often played for laughs, because Grog does not think he's dumb. We could attempt to steal them. Steal from the Goliaths. That could work. How easy is that? Does he wear them all the time? I mean, does he put them in a chest? They're pretty smart, they're like me. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a lesson. Pride is a great flaw, but it can also be used in such a way to make the game more fun for everyone if it's used right. Notice, Grog's pride hasn't put them into any danger they weren't already going to face. It's just made getting there a bit more interesting. But that actually brings us to another subject, and this is our second lesson. Because Grog really, really does not want to face Kevdak. And he tries so many different excuses to try to get them to go on another quest first. But notice how he keeps phrasing it. Oh no, man, we, I mean, whenever. It's, if that's what you want to do, then yeah. He never says, I don't want to go, though that's obvious from his body language and how he's speaking. But that also means that he's not saying no if that's what the party wants to do. Sure, he has concerns, and finally he does actually make a really compelling argument for going to see the Sphinx first to try to get whatever other benefit they can. But I do get the impression that if the rest of the party made a case for going after the Knuckles first, Travis would not stop that from happening. Grog would have his objections, but he would follow the group. And this, such a great solution to the my character wouldn't go there slash wouldn't do that conundrum. At so many game tables, when a player feels like their character would not reasonably go on some mission, they just shut down, and it becomes like role-playing with a brick wall. But here, Travis is role-playing Grog as an open invitation to engage with him. The party is able to react in character and respect his feelings, but he's doing the same to them. He's giving them the space to help make the decision. It's just such a good way to tackle this situation. I really like this moment from Travis. Thanks to a low intelligence roll, Keyleth can't recall any trees in the Frostweld uh, well enough to go and travel through them. So instead, she brings them to a forest she remembers just north of Westron, and then they're going to travel south as clouds, they're going to go past Western and into the Frostweald, the forest where they can find Osisa's mate. And this is interesting. As she casts a spell on the nearest trees she can think of, Matt actually volunteers a tree they would remember from a pre-stream game in Western. And they seem excited to remember it, so sure, let's go there. Even though the plan is not to go to Western at all. But Matt uses nostalgia to invite them to want to be in Western. And then he says, that, no, this tree wouldn't work. She tries to teleport to it, but it must not be there anymore. Then he brings up the forest north of Westron, again tying it to a pre-stream adventure that they remember when they fought some bandits. They can teleport there and travel past Westron to the Frostweald. But of course, Matt is very deliberately putting them north of Westron, so they have to go past Westron. Because Matt has been dropping hints about Westron for several episodes, and now he is actively steering them toward it. But he's doing so with a very soft touch. It's really impressive. As they fly past Westron, they see a spot where the locals drop off gold for the dragon. There are also fortifications built around each entrance to the city. They also notice that some farms have been burned, and the ones that are still in place have an armed guard watching the farmers work, and shouting at them, and harassing them. This is a terrific bit of shorthand to make it clear what's going on. These guards are not here for the farmers' protection. They're here to keep the farmers working. The people of Westron are imprisoned. Vax is the first to land in the field and revert to physical form, and the others just follow his lead, just so they can talk about this, since they cannot speak to each other as clouds. Now that they can talk, they start to discuss how... There's really nothing they can do. If they kill the guards and free the farmers, the city could starve. Or as Percy points out, they could just send more guards and kill everyone who rose up. But right as they say, there's nothing we can do, Matt introduces a farmer to help give more exposition. This guy literally almost runs right into them because they're so well hidden in the grass. Or the stalks of whatever the plants are. Because again, I think Matt has been trying to get them to go to Westron. I think he'd be okay if they don't go into the city, but there's an important reveal here. He's been trying to steer them here with some clues, like how Lady Kima was going to charge to Westron to rescue Allura. That might have revealed this information. And he hinted at it again when they scried on Allura in Westron. He just wants them to know what's going on there. Now they're here, and they're not going to get away without getting some exposition. So as soon as they start to talk about leaving, he drops a bruised and beaten farmer in front of them to invite them to get some more information in a much more safe way. The party tells the farmer to act casual and keep working as he answers their questions. His name is Reginald, and here's what they learn from him. The dragon is bad, duh, but it only comes around every couple of days to collect its loot. The people serving the dragon and controlling Westron are worse. They're keeping the farmers working to feed the city and raiding any caravan that passes nearby. The farmer's daughter and other similar hostages are being held in the city. The people working for the dragon did not originally serve him, like the wyverns and lizardfolk in Amon. In fact, they fought the dragon and then settled on a truce. And then Vox Machina realizes who these people are that are working for the dragon. The orcs, the... whatever they are. Big, strong, angry ones that keep taking all of our stuff. They have... Oh, no. 
Um. Why? Why? What do they look like? Do they look like him, maybe? Some do. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> Fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> Rog's tribe came into Westeron after the dragons attacked, and since Westeron was weak, they conquered it. Then the black dragon came back and fought the tribe before landing on their current arrangement. The party scopes out the nearest guard, and Grog recognizes him from his herd days. His name is Horus. They hide in the brush, and Reginald calls Horus over, and then Grog pins Horus and questions him. Horus confirms that the tribe actually conquered and folded in another tribe last year. They were about 100 strong before the dragon fight. Now they're at about 50 to 60. And they live like kings, ruling over the masses and handing off most of their spoils to the dragon. Kevdak is even living in the Margrave's mansion. Westrun is now property of the herd. <laughs> Boy, sounds really good. You've missed out. And had quite a few openings now since we've lost a few of the uh, lasted strong folk. You look strapping. I'm sure Kev would be more than happy to have you back, hey? Eh? I do. I've actually brought a few gifts. My notch and arrows. I unsheath Craven Edge. Craven Edge. I hold it up. Right. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I ask out loud, are you hungry? I mean, it's, it's been probably half a day since breakfast, aye? Why? <laughs> his expression begins to shift as the realization begins to dawn on his face. I pull it back, I stick the point in between his ribcage, and I drive it up through him. Oh! Rock says that they should do some recon on the city, but once again, his pride prevents him from going in as mist. He says if he's going into the city, he's going in as himself. Scanlan hangs out with him uh, outside in the field while the others turn into mist and go inside. As they scout the city, Matt brings up locations they would remember from their home game, including Wilhand's house and a mage's house that are both still standing. The Margrave's house has another barricade around it since that's where Kevdak is living. Meanwhile, Grog finally confides in Scanlan about the sword and his dream. It's a great scene, time codes are on screen, I really love this interaction and you should watch the whole thing, it's great. But here are the highlights. Grog admits he hears a voice from Craven Edge, but when he talks to Craven Edge here, Scanlan doesn't hear anything. He tries to hand Craven Edge to Scanlan to see if he hears it, but Grog fails a charisma check and cannot part with the sword. It means too much to him, and Grog is obviously the only one worthy to wield it, according to the magical blood-drinking sword. So Scanlan casts Suggestion and convinces Grog to hand off the sword, though Grog has to make another saving throw to resist the urge to hang on to it. But he succeeds this time, so Scanlan gets the sword. But Craven Edge wants Scanlan to prove his worthiness, and angles the blade to point at Reginald. Feed me, Seymour. Skinlin hands the sword back to Grog, and Grog is just relieved that he's not going crazy. Always hungry. Yeah. I you heard, heard it, Tom. Holy oh, shit! Yeah. I feel like Kevin Costner of Field of Dreams, and you're James Earl Jones. I don't know. What I've that got is. a friend in this <laughs> now. <laughs> Scanlan does not know much about the sword, and he'll talk to Pike about it next time they see her, but otherwise, Grog makes Scanlan swear not to tell the rest of the party. The rest of their team returns and delivers the information, and they've got two ways to get the Knuckles. They can try to sneak into the house and somehow get them away from Kevdak in his sleep, no idea yet how they do that, and Grog wouldn't really be able to sneak in as well as them, so that's a hard sell. Our option two, Grog confronts Kevdak in a one-on-one -on -one fight. If they all engage Kevdak, then they'll be facing a herd of 60 people. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, They've got much better odds. Now what that would look like, whether he'd go in alone with the party in the shadows, or they'd try to draw Kevdak out of the city, all that is a question for another day. Because Grog is not ready. And he wants Pike with them when he does this, since this is her hometown too. And they know Ashley's filming schedule is wrapping up soon, but obviously she's not here just yet. Besides, Kevdak isn't going anywhere. They promise Reginald that they'll be back soon to help, and then they turn back into mist and fly off toward the Frostweald. And that's where they end the session for the day. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back in two weeks for episode 48, Into the Frostweald. I think there's going to be a lot of cool little lessons in this one, but also this episode features one of my all-time favorite funny moments in Critical Role history. It's so good. But more on that in two weeks. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, support me on Patreon, join my Discord, follow me on Twitch, and sign up for my newsletter. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. If you missed my recent announcement about my plans for the channel this year, I'll check that video out right here. Until next time, play fair and have fun.